Dear fellow Rotarians and friends, warm greetings to all of you. I am Ramesh Hariharan, your district governor. The situations around COVID-19 have been constantly changing. Infection rates and hospitalizations have been rising in certain locations and been flat in certain others. From a Rotary perspective, are we ready for in-person meetings yet? As you know, we have formed a task force to combat coronavirus. They are competent experts in the medical field. We had town hall webinars on March 20th, April 20th, and May 15th. We have received positive feedback about the information and education received by you. Our experts have been continuing their work diligently, gathering invaluable information for the benefit of our district membership and the world at large. This follow-up webinar is a sincere attempt to update you on the new developments and continuing challenges we are facing during this pandemic. Kindly note that we'll be addressing only medical questions, specifically those that are related to coronavirus prevention and treatment. Welcome to our fourth online town hall webinar with our panel of experts to discuss the challenges our communities are facing as a result of the spread of coronavirus. Over to the chairman of the task force, a member of the Rotary Club of Los Altos, Dr. Jack Higgins. Thank you, Ramesh. I also want to welcome everyone to our fourth town hall webinar. I'm Jack Higgins. I'm a family physician and for the past 20 years I've been a member of Los Altos Rotary. This month I'm finishing up my two-year term on the board of directors where I've been in charge of international service. I also work with three nonprofit organizations based here in the Bay Area. Once again, we've assembled a panel of experts in public health, four doctors and a nurse who are all Rotarians in District 5170. Some of the information that you hear today may differ from what you hear from other sources. Every day there's a deluge of information related to COVID-19. And unfortunately, a large proportion of what we're getting is either misinformation for people who are poorly informed or disinformation from bad actors with malignant intent who want to confuse us so we're not sure anymore who and what we can believe. These posts often tell you not to believe what doctors and scientists say, and that's, that's a bad thing to do. We filter our information carefully, that is the panelists here, and depending on sources like Stanford and UCSF, Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, and the California Department of Public Health, those are all people and institutions that are doing their level best to provide accurate science-based information to help us get through this crisis. The purpose of these town hall webinars is to give you a counterpoint to all that noise out there on the internet. We're all Rotarians. We all follow the philosophies of service above self and the four-way test. Of course, this is where I need to call attention to our disclaimer. The information that we're providing has been carefully vetted and it reflects the best science currently available. That doesn't mean that everything we say will be correct next year or next week or even tomorrow because so much that we don't know yet about the novel coronavirus. After all, it's novel. It's a brand new virus. It's very different from anything we've ever seen before. Some viruses play by the rules. This one does not. So as it says in the disclaimer, we're offering the best information we can find, but it shouldn't be considered formal medical advice. And you shouldn't make any serious medical decisions based on this information. We encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A box, but for specific advice related to your situation, consult with your physician and do not delay seeking help because of the information that we're providing here in this webinar. If you're concerned about your health and you can't reach your doctor, call the advice line for either your nearest hospital or your county hospital or call 211. But if you think you might have a medical emergency, don't, hit, don't hesitate to, to dial 911 to get immediate help. Now we'll have brief presentations by each of our five panelists. I've asked each of them to introduce themselves and take a few minutes to discuss a topic of special interest. Then we'll spend the rest of our time responding to questions from all of you. We plan to stop at six o'clock, but all the panelists have agreed to stay on the call for another half hour in case people still have more questions and want to discuss things in more detail. Then we'll shut down completely at 6.30 p.m. And now we'll start with Dr. Peter Sherris. Thank you, Jack. I, I look forward to, to uh, discussing this further with other, with other folks in this uh, webinar. I've been asked to discuss the current COVID situation, testing, 
asymptomatic transmission and whether or not Rotary should resume in-person meetings. Next slide. I'm afraid here in the United States, we're not doing so well. Cases have stabilized, but are now beginning to increase again. Next slide. On this map, red indicates increasing transmission, and you can see that it's concentrated in the south and southeast, places that opened up early. There are also outbreaks occurring in rural Oregon and Washington among food processing, agricultural workers, and indigenous Americans. Next slide. In California, we're also seeing increases. Next slide. In the Bay Area, we're experiencing increases, especially in Alameda County, where there's a large cluster in West Oakland with 909 new cases in the last 14 days. Next slide. If you compare death rates per 100,000 per month, we are in an identical situation to where we were in World War II, seven deaths per 100,000 per month. Why is there so little worry and fear? In the face of these numbers, why are so many anxious to open even non-essential institutions like Rotary? Next slide. This disease is infecting the poor and those who have to work outside their homes. It's twice as deadly for blacks than whites and even more so for the elderly, especially those who are in nursing homes. Is it possible that our lack of sense of urgency is because we marginalize those that are at most at risk? Next slide. I was asked to talk again about testing and nothing's changed since last time except maybe this slide. Next slide. The availability of tests is no longer a problem. The PCR test for the presence of the virus is highly accurate, but only meaningful at one single point of time. You have a negative test today, you can be infectious tomorrow. Antibody tests remain unreliable. There are scams and really bad tests out there that should never have been allowed on the market. A positive antibody test does not confirm immunity. If you get an antibody test, whether it's positive or negative, it doesn't change anything you need to do to protect yourself. Next slide. The WHO put out a statement a couple of weeks ago that asymptomatic transmission was rare. That statement was misleading and the WHO reversed it the next day. Asymptomatic cases are of two types, a pre-symptomatic group and a truly asymptomatic group who will never develop symptoms. The truly, the truly asymptomatic group probably doesn't transmit the virus very often because they don't appear to generate very many viral particles. Pre-symptomatic patients are in a completely different category. They typically have high viral loads. They're about half as likely to transmit infection than a symptomatic person, probably because they're not coughing and sneezing. They are estimated to have caused about 80% of the transmissions in Wuhan, China because there are just so many people who were infectious and asymptomatic. Multiple studies have been done that indicate that at the time of a PCR test, about 15 to 40% of people are asymptomatic when they have a positive test. The answer is to wear your mask. There's now, next slide please. There is good evidence now that masks are very effective at reducing your chance of infecting someone else. Next slide. What about resuming in-person rotary meetings? We have to balance the benefit versus the risk. The major benefit is more social interactions. Some feel that we need in-person meetings to fundraise and organize service projects. I would argue that we can do this work almost as well virtually, and we can talk about that in Q&A if you want. The risk, of course, is that we put our members at higher risk of becoming infected. Many of our members can pass the cassette and pencil test, and they need to be extremely careful. Next slide. The Rotary Club of Oakland has an average age of 61. Half our members are at high risk. I'm 72, and if I get this bug, I have a 10% chance of dying, and that's gonna keep me home. Next slide. As of today, Bay Area counties do not meet the state's criteria to move forward on their resilience roadmap. Next slide. We miss our friends. Political and social economic reopening is happening all around us. But Rotarians, please remember that the virus doesn't care. It has one goal and one goal only, 
and that's to reproduce in you. It's now my absolute pleasure to introduce my friend, Aggie Freeman, RN. Peter, I'm Aggie Freeman, and as many of you know, I've District Governor Ramesh this year as Sergeant at Arms in the events that we've been having at DRICO. Many of us have been staying at home for a while now, and we're wondering when can we resume meetings in person. As California counties relax lockdown measures for businesses and the nice weather arrives, it's only normal for us to miss the fellowship with our friends, including Rotarians. It's tempting to expand in-person interactions outside of our immediate household and hold social events in our own backyard, which is a violation of the state and county shelter in place orders. And as Dr. Sherris was saying, this is even as the coronavirus pandemic rages on. Alameda County posted the highest rate of new infections this week since testing began. So how risky is it really to start socializing for non-essential reasons with family and friends and people you love? Because businesses are opening up, doesn't that mean that we can start rotary meetings again? Our answer is no, and here's why. We have only one way really to, meet, to eliminate the risk, and that's the online Zoom meetings or go to meetings that we're doing. That is the safest way for Rotarians to meet and for us to connect with our families. At, in the public health, we look at low risk, medium risk, and high risk. So examples are given here. Low risk would be your own household, going grocery shopping, accepting deliveries, taking walks, and cycling. An example of medium risk activities would be going outdoors, going to the post office, UPS, FedEx, grocery stores, Costco, and pharmacies, places where you would be in contact with members of the community. High risk activities would include direct interactions, whether they're indoor or outdoor, in-person meetings, especially where there's face-to-face -face contact. So here is what we think about when we talk about managing your risk of infection. The first step is to know the infection rate in your own community. The second is to limit your close contacts with others who are outside of your household. The third is to manage your risk by limiting the time you're out at the grocery store or out at the post office. So go at non-peak times, go at times when there'd be less likely to be a crowd. Number four, keep your risky activities brief. Number five, don't let your guard done. And six, adhere to the Department of Health shelter in place orders. To know your in community infection risk, I use the site covidactnow.org. I look for the percentage of COVID-19 positive test, the rate in the county, the rate in the city, and I look to see whether over the past two weeks, the infection rate of new cases is 5% or lower. Also know where you can get yourself tested. We think the best way to start with this is to call your own primary care provider. There are county testing sites and there are many studies, including studies at UCSF, where you can be tested as part of the study. So in managing your risk, you've got to look at the risk versus the benefit trade-offs. We know that infection is exposure to the virus over time. So we ask that you balance the events. We're finding as people in the community and the weather is opening that uh, people are not following the shelter in place guidelines. Some of the things to consider is how much open space is there if you're out in public? What are the numbers of other people attending? How long will you be there? Can you be there and avoid face-to-face -face close proximity? And are you and those around you wearing face covering when you're in public? Some families are of two households are forming what's called a quarantine pod where they socialize with each other. Before they get together, they ask, is anyone in your household ill? Has anyone tested positive? And the key here is consistency. It's really important to remember that asymptomatic teenagers and adults can infect older, high-risk adult family members. So don't let your guard down. Know the current infection rate in your community. Be extra cautious with family members when they're high risk and you're in close proximity by wearing your face mask. 
And remember that COVID-19 has no cure, no vaccine, and there's no medication. So prevention is the cure until we have the vaccine. Adherence to the prevention steps is the key to avoiding getting infected. Remember to frequently wash your hands. When you can't wash your hands, use hand sanitizer. Maintain physical distancing. Quarantine if you've had a high risk activity and self isolate. And wear your face covering when you're out in the public places. And this guy had a t-shirt made so everyone would know who he was. Now it's my pleasure to introduce pediatrician Arthur Dover. Thank you, Aggie. I'm going to talk about some aspects of uh, children's involvement in the pandemic. The virus is still very much a threat, as you've heard from my uh, preceding colleagues. Scientists don't have clear answers about whether people can acquire protective immunity or how easily children can acquire and transmit the virus. However, for California, early this month, California reported over 3,000 childhood cases. This means young people under 18 years of age, and 80% of them acquired the infection by household transmission. Unlike adults, many children are asymptomatic carriers. It's thought that they have fewer of the receptors for the virus in the respiratory tree. They can easily be asymptomatic carriers, especially the teenagers and they can be contagious before showing symptoms. Serious disease among young people is quite uncommon, although a few deaths have been reported. So questions come up. Should my child have a play date? This requires uh, some serious investigation before saying yes. I know the young children especially are hurting psychologically for lack of being with their playmates in a social situation. You need to evaluate the origin of that child coming for a play date. Is there someone sick in that house or has someone been sick recently? Is there someone there who is in quarantine? Have family members in that house had multiple uh, exposures outside of the circle? Have they had contacts with high-risk people with underlying conditions? Next question is, can I take my child to the playground? Uh, this is a very poor um, activity for children because there are multiple exposures in a playground. There's no regular disinfection of equipment or bathrooms. Much safer would be a walk in the woods. How about family vacation, family travel this summer? The safest mode of travel is by automobile. What's the disease level at your destination? Going to a cabin in the woods would be far safer than the alternative, the other extreme, would be staying in a hotel in a large city. And then, is it okay to hire a babysitter? Well, is that person symptom free? Is that person self quarantining at the moment? Is it a mature person? Or is it a teenager who hangs out with a lot of unmasked colleagues most of the time. So then we ask, should my child get a coronavirus antibody test? Uh, is no, uh, currently, as you've heard, there's very little useful and reliable information about this. And then should I worry about the newly described Kawasaki-like multiple inflammatory condition linked to COVID virus? Uh, the answer is no. It's a terrible uh, disease. It, it starts out with high fever, it's prolonged and a rash. It's quite rare, although serious. Should your child have those symptoms, and that means that high fever is for more than 24 hours, you definitely should seek your healthcare provider. And for any illness in your child with fever and a cough, you should contact a health provider. So then I wanna mention very briefly school reopenings. This is an extremely complex situation. There are uh, multiple guidelines that in the uh, documents you see before you, strong, stronger together from the state health, 55 pages, very, very complex. The ultimate decision is made by the individual school district, and I'm sure there will be many, many modifications and additions to this as we get closer to school reopening time. So thank you for your attention. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Richard Godfrey. Thank you. 
Art, thank you very much. It's always an honor to uh, present to the webinar and to 5170, and thank you all for participating, and I hope we can get many questions and give you good answers. Next slide, please. I'd like to address the question, what are Rotarians doing globally and locally in the time of the coronavirus? And it turns out Rotarians worldwide are now using the polio infrastructure to help test and stop the spread of the virus. We're doing surveillance, health worker training, contact tracing, uh, and we're working in at least 13 countries right now. Um, let's talk a little bit about some examples. Pakistan is an example, uh, working with the government there, Rotarians in particular have helped train 280 special COVID-19 surveillance officers, along with 20,000 volunteer community mobilizers. We've developed a new data system that's fully integrated with the polio system, and that data is supported. And we have 6,260 health professionals that have undergone cascade training to handle the current pandemic. So we're really very engaged. Other examples might include Afghanistan and Nigeria. We're a training specialist in the STOP program, which is part of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Uh, they are now responding worldwide to COVID-19. We've trained 6,000 health workers in Afghanistan directed to do COVID-19 work. And as mentioned, there's many other countries that are part of the infrastructure put together through Polio Plus. So we're really quite active on the global area. Next slide. Yeah. And I, I wanna talk about another virus since Rotary has a special capacity to work worldwide. And that's the human papilloma virus. Uh, as you probably are familiar, it's responsible for 270,000 deaths each year. And that's particularly with women and mothers in low income and middle income countries where they're in the midst of the most important part of their family lives. And so it's a devastating disease. Example is for uh, work from Area 3 Rotary through 5170. We've now in the last year funded two infectious disease clinics. Uh, in Guatemala, we've examined recently 1,000 patients through VIA. More importantly, we've trained the Guatemalans to do that inspection and exam and the treatment of early and late stage cervical cancer. So we're moving forward in a number of areas. And once the pandemic's over, we'll be back in Guatemala to finish a lot of that work there. And we're turning to Belize, which is a much smaller country. And we have a goal of eliminating cervical cancer completely by the year 2030. So what do we do locally? Well, there's a lot going on and probably things that you yourselves are doing. Uh, and I wanna congratulate everyone in the Rotary community for mastering virtual reality, for mastering Zoom meetings like this. It's really, I think, allowing us to find ways to connect at difficult times. We do this often just with our group breakout sessions where we amplify our connectivity and come up with ideas of what we can do more within our local uh, Rotary clubs. Um, and we've been serving the community. We're giving blood, we're distributing PPEs, meals, supplies, masks. And finally, we're outreaching to the most vulnerable in our clubs and our community. And I'm sure each of you has made phone calls in that way. And I wanna thank you all for that work and if we could have the next slide. I'm very pleased to introduce you to Dr. Arlene Noodleman, who's gonna talk a little bit about what we do for ourselves. Thanks, Richard. I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Morgan Hill, and I'm a preventive and occupational medicine physician with training additionally in integrative medicine. Next. So I wanna talk about five integrative health strategies in the, in the, in the time of COVID and integrative medicine relies on evidence-based healing-oriented approaches, and they tend to be less invasive whenever possible. In terms of COVID-19, the strategies are uh, focusing around reducing inflammation to help prevent and possibly even treat disease. So acute inflammation is noted by the viral activation of complex proteins called inflammasomes. And these inflammasomes release pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are responsible for the cytokine storm that is responsible for so much of the morbidity and mortality 
of severe COVID disease. But also chronic inflammation has a part in COVID in that our Western lifestyle has resulted in uh, a lot of sedentary, uh, lack of exercise, stress, poor sleep habits, and poor eating habits. And all these together have resulted in inappropriate low-level inflammation chronically, which increases the risk of developing chronic diseases such as hypertension, obesity and diabetes, heart disease. And these in turn increase the risk of severe COVID-19 because I, as I'm sure you've seen on the news, the people with these pre-existing conditions are more likely to have severe disease. So what are these strategies? The first is getting adequate sleep. And the value of a good night's sleep uh, cannot be uh, over, overstated. And there have been studies where people who uh, have gotten seven or more hours of sleep a night have a decreased risk of developing viral infections. They also have decreased inflammasome activation. And those people with adequate sleep have, in, have improved melatonin secretion and it's thought that perhaps, uh, which is age related, so it's thought that children have less severe COVID disease because they have higher rates of melatonin. The second strategy is to reduce stress. Stress is very disruptive to the immune system. Again, increasing those pro-inflammatory cytokines and inflammasomes. And the use of regular mindful te not mindfulness techniques can reduce stress. These include meditation, breathing exercises, guided imagery, again, decreasing the expression of pro-inflammatory genes and decreasing inflammation. The third strategy is to consider targeted supplements. And as an integrative physician, I advocate the judicious use of supplements, and these are pre-infection. There is a, a, some different recommendations um, once someone has, has COVID. So the four that are the most talked about and, and, and looked at are vitamin C, and IV vitamin C is actually currently being studied in terms of treatment as well, melatonin, zinc, and vitamin D. And we do have an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency in this country, and so I would urge all of you to uh, consider uh, taking vitamin D suppl supplementation, one to 2,000 international units per day. Fourth, adopt an anti-inflammatory diet. Again, inflammation is the key operative word here. A diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, and of course, uh, monounsaturated fats and low sugar, uh, uh, complex uh, carbohydrates are the cornerstone of eating in an anti-inflammatory way. And that is five to seven servings of vegetables and two to three servings of fruit per day. And that's because in terms of COVID, that fruits and vegetables contain flavonoids. Again, those flavonoids are responsible for a decrease of inflammasome signaling. Foods that are high in flavonoids include onions, garlic, parsley, celery, apples, tomatoes, oranges, nuts, and berries. And it's also known that curcumin found in turmeric and garlic, licorice, and green tea are all high in, flav in flavonoids. And the fifth strategy is to create positive social connections. And we know that loneliness and isolation increase the risk of disease and premature death from all causes by 200 to 500%. I feel like I need to repeat that, that loneliness increases the risk of disease and death by 200 to 500% percent and it's really gr a greater than any other lifestyle risk factor and it turns out that our brains are very sensitive to the experience of being alone and now as we know there are a lot of people in our culture that are living alone that are isolated but now superimposed on top of that is the forced social isolation of covid and studies have been done in in this area and people who have been isolated like this have changed neural biochemistries and create, this creates a neural craving in the brain that's similar actually to hunger. And chronic loneliness is associated with domestic violence, alcoholism, suicide, and a reduced motivation to socially engage. So it's sort of a, a vicious cycle. 
So what to do? Stay connected. And in this time, we're recommending staying connected virtually, using the telephone and telephone trees to reach out to our membership, and especially reaching out to elder Rotarians and community members who are living alone. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Jack Higgins, who is going to talk about changes in healthcare delivery. Thanks, Arlene. I was asked to talk about uh, changes in healthcare delivery in the age of coronavirus and the dramatic increase in the use of telehealth over the past few months. The terms telehealth and telemedicine are pretty much interchangeable to describe doctors and patients seeing each other through an internet connection, so they don't have to be in the same place. Telehealth has been around for decades, but it's gained tremendous popularity in the last few months because medical practices need to handle most encounters through phone calls or video visits just for safety purposes. I started seeing patients through telehealth 28 years ago in 1992. Working from my family practice office in Chico, I provided free care for patients in a small clinic in the village of Mad River up in the Trinity Mountains. If somebody showed up in the clinic on Mondays when the nurse practitioner wasn't there, the clinic manager would call me and we'd connect with video over telephone lines because the internet didn't have adequate bandwidth yet in 1992. Since then, we've done other pilot projects connecting doctors at Stanford University with patients in the Dominican Republic, and another connected a diabetes specialist in Redwood City with patients at the Rotacare Free Clinic in inner city San Jose. Uh, Rotacare Bay Area is a nonprofit that operates free medical clinics at 10 locations here in the Bay Area. It was started by Rotarians over 30 years ago, and I've been on the board for 19 years now. We provide free medical care for people that have no insurance, no Medi-Cal, and no money, and we're all volunteers. Rotacare was going strong until March, when COVID-19 made it unsafe for patients and for providers, so we had to shut down all the clinics. Now that we've obtained enough personal protective equipment, PPE, we're starting to slowly and cautiously reopen. But many of our patients have high risk due to their age or medical conditions, and we don't want to expose them to possible uh, COVID. At the same time, many of our physician volunteers are around retirement age like me, or they have medical conditions that put them at high risk. So we're developing a system that lets some of the doctors work from home to see patients who come into the clinics. Whenever possible, they'll also see patients who are able to connect from their own homes. Now, in the past, that wouldn't have been possible, but Rotacare has just received a COVID-19 emergency grant from the government. And that's gonna allow us to purchase tablet computers that we can loan to our high-risk patients. We'll also loan them devices to measure blood pressure, heart rate, weight, blood sugar, and blood oxygen levels. All those devices have wireless connections to the patient's cell phones, and they'll transmit that data to the clinics. Our new system will also allow us to obtain online consults with specialists, which has always been a problem in the past. Finding a specialist would be willing to see the patient in their office. Now the specialist can see them online. When we formed the District Coronavirus Task Force, we talked about exploring ways we could do two, th uh, three things, help our fellow Rotarians, help our communities, and help internationally. Dr. Richard Godfrey talked for a bit about our international efforts to fight the viruses that cause polio and cervical cancer. Now we want to assist in the battle against this new virus that causes COVID-19. Several of our Rotarians are involved with another nonprofit that can provide free telehealth services for the poor not only here in the US, but also in limited resource countries around the world. The Global Telehealth Network is recruiting volunteer physicians and psychologists who can provide free online consults to help health workers in those countries when they encounter patients that have complex problems. Those health workers will go to our website to request a consult and they'll upload information about the patient, basically the patient's electronic health record. Then they'll be matched with the most appropriate physician somewhere in the world to help them resolve the problem. We're starting at several sites in Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania, and we're beginning to partner with an organization called IEEE Smart Village. You know, IEEE is an international organization of engineers. You see their uh, initials in the back of a lot of electrical products that you buy. Well, Smart Village is a division of that that can provide solar power installations and internet access for clinics and hospitals that are in remote locations. We're also proposing to partner with District 5170 and with Rotary Districts in East Africa to identify places with the greatest need, and then to help us get them connected to our network. Those three countries in East Africa were quick to order lockdowns, and so far COVID-19 hasn't gained a major foothold, but we're pretty well convinced that it's soon gonna become a major problem there. 
Meanwhile, doctors in Europe and the US are getting a lot of experience with COVID-19. So we're hoping that through telehealth, they'll be able to help in the battle against COVID-19 as it begins to spread in other countries. And so we're gonna begin our question and answer segment. So that first question from Dr. Sharis is, how are we doing on case identification and contact tracing and how can it help? So contact tracing, uh, what is the state? Well, it's important to remember that the reason we had shelter in place was because we failed to implement contact tracing, case identification and isolation. Uh, it is the first line of defense. Uh, sheltering in place is the last. It's what you do when you've lost control. On my first slide, uh, I put together a, a comparison between our population adjusted numbers uh, in, of cases comparing uh, the United States to countries such as South Korea and Vietnam and uh, Taiwan who implemented contact tracing early and aggressively. Those countries that did so have two to three orders of magnitude fewer cases and deaths than we do. And they've done it with much fewer tests and smaller health budgets. You'll notice that Singapore actually has more cases per population than we do, but they have a death rate that's almost 100 times less than ours. Why is that? That's because they identified cases in immigrant workers very quickly. They quarantined them very aggressively and thus protected their vulnerable older citizens from becoming infected. And we've done none of this. So what have we done in California? Next slide. We're in the process right now. This is the slide that I got from the governor today. Uh, we are not where we want to be. We have 2,243 contact traces who have been trained out of the 10,000 goal and the 20,000 that we need. And only about 25 counties are onboarded uh, for contact tracing. So it's not functioning yet. I also have a slide from Washington, which is where, the, uh, where this whole thing began. The goal of contact tracing is 90-90-90. 90% of cases identified, 90% of contacts traced, and 90% of those who need isolation compliant. There's only one county in Washington where this has been accomplished, and that's King County, where this whole thing started. And so we're really left throughout the country and here in California without the safety of contact tracing. And we really just have to continue physical distancing, personal hygiene, and masks. Jack? Thank you, Peter. Next question is a little longer, so bear with me. It's uh, when society gradually reopens, how can we take care of family members who have weakened immune systems from problems like Lyme disease? Those family members are 16 and 50 years old and are otherwise healthy. I'd like to volunteer Arlene because she's already spoken a little bit to this, but clearly I, I think the other messages that you've heard are the importance of protecting through isolation, not necessarily quarantine, but if you know somebody's at increased risk due to any immune disorder, uh, we're definitely not out of the danger zone yet. And um, some of the things you can do to protect yourselves, Arlene might speak to. Well, I think I, I pretty much, you know, address the, the big picture of, of lifestyle in, in terms of immunity. Um, we're not really talking about medications uh, in, this, in this panel or from my, what I've been uh, charged to do. So again, it's, um, it's all the, we know that, um, we know that lifestyle is responsible for 80% of chronic disease. We know that. And, um, and so by making these changes, which are difficult to make, it's difficult to change a habit, but by doing that and doing and having a, a regular program, incremental goal setting, uh, one's biophysiologic inflammatory milieu can be changed and can be improved. And, and this is a known fact, but it's not often really discussed uh, because we, we kind of go towards drugs and procedures a little too quickly. Uh, next question is, do you need to wash your hands with antibacterial soap to kill the coronavirus? Well, I, I can respond to that in that the virus does not do well with regular old soap. It doesn't uh, survive very well with, with just regular hand washing. Again, it's that singing happy birthday or the 20 seconds and you know, doing a good wash, but um, I don't think there's a need unless anybody else on the panel has another thought, but I don't think we need antibacterial soaps. 
Yeah, I, I just reinforce that, and reinforce that uh, impression. The antibacterial soap is handy for bacteria, but it really has nothing to do with the viruses, but just soap, especially detergent, like the dishwashing detergent plus water uh, is very effective in destroying the, the virus. Uh, the next question is, do any natural cleaners kill the coronavirus? Yeah, I, I, can, I can take that. I think it's very important that when you are buying cleaners, you need, to, you need to look at the ingredients. You need to look what the labels say. Uh, if the label says kills 99.9% .9 of uh, bacteria, then that is going to be a cleaner that contains uh, chemicals that are going to destroy the uh, virus. Uh, so, uh, and if it contains soap, if it contains alcohol, yes. But there are some cleaners out there which don't make that statement. And so I actually choose not to purchase those. Uh, partly because that's controlled by the, you know, the, that label that they put on means that they contain certain ingredients by the government. I'd like to co-tail on what Peter is saying. I was asked if vinegar will kill COVID and after doing some research, vinegar does not work as a disinfectant. There is a way you can take some uh, bleach and put it in a quart of water and put it in a spray bottle and that's probably the most cost effective way washing your hands with regular soap, it doesn't need to be antiseptic soap, is very effective in controlling. And how about the disinfectant wipes for grocery carts? Do they kill the coronavirus? Yeah, so I actually have no idea what, because I don't know what they're using. Sometimes I look at those and think maybe they're just water to make me feel better. So I actually carry my <laughs> own disinfecting wipes into the grocery store to clean the cart. I could be wrong, Jack, but I believe most of those are um, based on chlorine and bleach. And I can tell you when we were dealing in Sierra Leone with the Ebola virus, which uh, was really easily transmitted by touch, uh, we used a, a reduced concentration of bleach, but we, we sprayed down everything, wiped down everything. And if you're not sure of the concentration, you can go online. It's a very low percentage of bleach added to water. Uh, but, but obviously you're not going to be using concentrated bleach. So you want to go online, get the correct dosage. And then, uh, other than that, look at the labels as Peter was just saying. It's, it's the concentration is five tablespoons of regular bleach per quart of water. Uh, also point out that some of the wipes really aren't very effective. Uh, for example, wet ones are very commonly used. And, uh, my understanding is that, um, uh, they don't include uh, anything that's necessarily really deadly for the viruses. Uh, on the other hand, Lysol apparently is quite effective and plain old alcohol does work very well too. And the hand sanitizers that have alcohol are very effective. Okay, I'll move on then. What about ultraviolet light, UV light? Does that kill coronavirus? I think the simple answer is yes, but Peter? Uh, well, it, yes. But the problem is, is that they're selling a lot of, quote, ultraviolet lights on the internet. I have no idea how much energy they put out. I, I, know, I don't know that any of them have been tested. So I, I, would, I would stay with cleaners and the bleach solution. We're talking about that. We know for sure soap and water is very effective. I know that and for vegetables that I'm worried about that I need to peel, I just dump them into uh, a, con a, a, a container which contains soapy water, let them sit there, wash them off, rinse them off, throw them in the sink. So soap and water and bleach and, the, and those cleaners that are listed as being antibacterial, the way to go. Great, thanks. Is it possible to get false positive or false negatives with the new coronavirus test? And uh, they're not specifying whether they're talking about the uh, one for current infection or the one uh, that looks for antibodies. Uh, anything else you want to add to that, Peter, to what you already said? No, we know that there are, every test has false positives and false negatives. The PCR test, which is testing for the viral uh, particles and the viral bits of RNA is very, very accurate. But again, you can get a after you've had an infection, you can probably get a positive PCR test and yet not be able to screen any viable virus because it may just be RNA particles, but that's a highly, highly accurate test. The antibody test, much less so. And uh, there's still a lot of antibody tests out there where in this population, with, only, with probably less than 5% of people infected, but somewhere between 
30 to 50 percent of the positive tests that you're going to get are going to be false positives. Sad but true. And we're, we're still waiting for the really good tests to come along. Uh, next question is, can you have both the flu and coronavirus at the same time? Well, the answer is yes. It, it's possible to have more than one infection at a time. And uh, there, there may actually be more incidents of that than we've realized in the past. Some of the research at Stanford is suggesting that may be fairly often the case. That uh, I believe they said that of the patients with COVID they studied, about 22% had another viral infection. Uh, which could be influenza, enterovirus, or respiratory syncytial virus. So yeah, you, you can get both. Uh, next question is, I heard that you can check yourself for coronavirus by holding your breath for 10 seconds and seeing if you feel discomfort or cough. Is that true? Uh, no, that's not true. If you're sick and you think you might have coronavirus, call your doctor. There was an email chain that came around uh, early in the pandemic that suggested that was the case. And uh, it's been pretty well disproven now. What about getting infected from coronavirus by touching mailed letters or packages? We have to remind people that the uh, undoubted major source of transmission is respiratory from another person. I'm not afraid of vegetables. I'm not afraid of packages from the store. I'm not worried much about the handle on the grocery cart, although I do clean it. And uh, I don't take that precaution with the mail. I'm not going to put the mail into my nose or mouth. How about if you touch an infected person's clothes? Can you get coronavirus that way? I'd, I'd echo what Art said, is that anything is possible, right? But, but the way people get this bug is that they are getting it from respiratory droplets that goes into their nose, or that they're, they're getting a very high concentration on their hands and touching their face and putting it into their nose. The, the whole story about surface transmission, as I see it, is actually becoming less and less worrisome. But nonetheless, I'm still taking precautions, as I say, cleaning uh, packages that are coming from outside and, and when I can, plastic packages, that kind of thing. I agree with what Peter's saying. What we're finding is if the virus is outside the host, um, that it's very private. It doesn't live very well and doesn't live very long. So we're leaving our packages and our mail sit for 24 hours. We're making sure we wash our hands very thoroughly after we open the mail or open the package. And we put newspapers down and make sure that that area is fairly clean. But I agree with Peter. It's a very low risk for exposure. So Aggie, let me ask you, I, you one of your slides talked about how long you're exposed to the virus and as is pointed out, it, we, we believe that a lot of this is through aerosol transmission. So if I go to the grocery store or if I'm in an enclosed space for several hours, and in addition, there are multiple people in that space, then doesn't that put me at risk greater with the amount of time and with the number of particles that might be transmitted as an aerosol? Yes, it does, especially if you're in the high risk category. And Wuhan, some of the studies that were shown that people were sitting in a family group at a round table of 10 in a restaurant, one of the family members was <clears throat> asymptomatic and COVID positive, and the ventilation system was effective in spreading the virus through other community in the restaurant. I see Art nodding his head. So, um, we're, we're looking at risk of exposure and in preventing disease transmission, some activities are higher risk than others. So going to the grocery store with a face mask is a medium risk. Going to the grocery store without a face mask, face covering, if you're a high risk individual can definitely result in infection. <laughs> Thank you. What safety precautions should you take when you're delivering food and other essentials to quarantined neighbors? Well, right now within uh, particularly Alameda County, but most parts of the Bay Area, we still have to follow the rules of standard six feet social distancing and wearing a mask. If you're dropping off food, then there's going to be some closer contact, but it's going to be very, very brief, very short. And as just mentioned, the likelihood of transmitting the virus through touch exists, but it's probably very small. So you're probably doing a lot more good than you are risking 
uh, in, in working in those fashions. So uh, my hat is off to anyone that's participating and, and helping out with delivery of food. And, you know, the, the people that probably we have to worry about the most would be those in the postal service. So we have to really thank them for the work that they're providing us. Thanks, Rich. A uh, question I'm not sure we have the answer to, how many Rotarians in 5170 have contracted the virus? Have there been any deaths or hospitalizations? Anybody know what the numbers are? I know of one death for sure. That death was published in the TRF uh, Foundation newsletter. Yes, so this is Peter. Um, I believe the death that Aggie is talking about is an amazing guy by the name of Gene Zaha, who is, was a member of the Rotary Club of Oakland. He was actually our treasurer. Uh, he went to New York, came back with the bug, and died after about three weeks in ICU. Thank all of you to have attended this webinar. We, haunt, we hope you found this webinar useful. Remember, we are here to serve you. We are here to keep you informed. And we are here to support you and strengthen you. We are here to connect with each other and utilize new opportunities to serve humanity. This question has come up many times. When are we ready to start in-person meetings? So here is uh, our panel of experts. We all are familiar with the four-way test, uh, the rotary four-way test, which is, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned, et cetera, et cetera. But this is what we, we feel that uh, is appropriate for the moment. For in-person meetings, think about these four-way tests. Is it essential? Will it be safe for all concerned? Will it be legal and will it be effective Will it effectively address liability? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Again, I'd like to thank all the panelists, the experts who have come and put a lot of hard work in to make this information useful for you. Stay inspired. We are Rotarians and we are people of action. Be safe. And um, thank you for participating. Uh, and the next one was about testing. And it's been touched on too, but it's a new question from Brad. So I want to go ahead and ask it of the panel. He says, I'm in a high risk age group. What is the prevailing recommendation for getting tested and how many times? So the prevailing recommendation for getting tested is to call your primary care physician and have that conversation with your physician. We know that asymptomatic individuals who want to be tested are now able to do so. Kaiser Permanente in Northern California just uh, opened up asymptomatic testing for their membership uh, earlier this month. Uh, you call a number, get an appointment, and go in and get tested, and your results are available in three to five days. If you are not connected to a primary care physician, this is a really good time to establish care with someone. If you need resources uh, on how to do that, you can reach out to anyone here on the panel and we'll be happy to guide you. And there are county tests that are free. There are studies that are going on where you can join. The blood bank tests your blood when you donate, so that's a great way to contribute. And uh, does any of the other medical group have something to add? Uh, the only thing I would add is that it's really important to, to ask your provider or advice nurse, Kaiser I know is doing it through advice nurses now, is to actually understand what it is you wanna learn, how you wanna use the information that you're gonna get because there are lots and lots of different reasons for testing. And there are some reasons, I think, which aren't actually, the test isn't going to accomplish what you want it to accomplish. So it's very important to talk about it with a medical provider. So here's something very specific. Uh, somebody says, uh, if you tested positive, but have no symptoms at all, what's the proper thing to do? Do you need to quarantine? Do you assume it's a false positive? Where do you go from there? Well, the first thing I would want you to do is repeat the test. Um, so that's the first thing, because pretty much one test is not enough. It's a Polaroid snapshot of what you were doing that day, of what was happening that day. And we know the incubation period is two to 14 days. So that only tells us that on that day that you took the test, you had enough virus in you to make the test register as a positive. And the next thing, and this is why we're suggesting that the primary contact be your doctor, because that's a conversation you wanna be having with your doctor. If you're in the emergency room, we are testing you when uh, we're making an evaluation. But at this time, we now have laboratory study results that we can use on a presumption that you're positive while we're waiting for the test. 
So I think the first thing to do is get retested, make sure you're connecting with your primary care doctor. And then I would suggest that you self-isolate. You've already exposed your family if you've tested positive for the virus. So one thought I have is that to have your family follow in and get tested. They may have been exposed, but not become infected. And then if it's possible to isolate yourself in a bedroom and in one solo bathroom, um, and we have a panelist who's had firsthand experience with that. So I'll toss this to Arlene for her thoughts as well. Well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think those of you who were on the last webinar, I kind of gave uh, my story about uh, becoming infected. And uh, when I was sheltering in place, but then went into a, a pretty um, extensive quarantine process for two weeks with separate bedrooms, separate bathrooms, you know, eating by myself with a tray brought to me um, and uh, just living in a very small part of my home and it worked, <laughs> but you know, it's not, it's, it, it goes, it's, it's more, you know, it's more than sheltering in place and it, it's, it's, it's it was a little bit tough, but um, it was necessary. So that's what, that's what really has to be done when, when you have that kind of an exposure or are exposed to someone who's, who's positive. Yeah, this is Peter. So both Aggie and Amina have been talking about what happens if you get positive PCR, a PCR test that actually tells you you carry the virus. And I agree that you, if you're asymptomatic, remember we already know that 15 to 40 percent of patients who have this virus at the time they have a PCR test are asymptomatic. So that's actually a very common situation. And most of those with that test mean that they have the virus and that they are potentially infectious. And so if you get a positive test, you need to isolate yourself. You may have already infected your family, but you may not. So you really need to isolate yourself and you need to have that conversation with your medical providers about what to do next. It's quite likely in that situation that you will become symptomatic because as I said in my presentation, truly asymptomatic people who have no symptoms whatsoever, they, they actually don't generate that much virus. Now, the other possibility that the person could be talking about is they went out and got an antibody test. You go out and get an antibody test and it's positive, it really doesn't change anything you need to do. You don't need to do more isolation. You don't need to do less, I'm sorry, you don't need to do more social distancing. You don't need to do less, everything's the same. It's just a, and it's an it's indication that you may have had this virus in the past. I agree. With wanna, oh, I'm sorry, Aggie, go ahead. And then I'll toss to you, Rich. I agree with everything Peter said at UCSF and at Kaiser Permanente. I've been talking with our team that is doing the testing and our leadership team. And we have found that the antibody testing that's currently available to us is about 50% of the time falsely negative. So we're not finding that we can rely on the antibody testing as a way. We're using the PCR test for diagnosing people who are infected with the virus and for treating them and also for keeping them away from our inpatients who don't have the virus. So I think the testing is really important if you're worried and you're well and you want an answer, but that doesn't change the behavior. It just gives you a moment in time. Rich, did you want to say something? I was just going to comment on something Peter said earlier, and that is, uh, remember there's a substantial difference between the PCR virus test and the antibody test. So if you or somebody you know is positive for the PCR virus test, then there's another thing you want to consider, and that's something we really haven't mastered yet in the Bay Area, and that is contact tracing. So in a sense, you, you or whoever you know that has definitely gotten the virus, you should be thinking, well, when did I most likely contact, contact it? Uh, what was that time period? When would I be most likely to transmit it? And who was I in contact with? So you might go back as, as much as a week and think of all the people. Were you at a, a meeting with a large group of people at any point? Were you with other relatives in your family? That's what contact tracing is about. And we're just starting down that, that track. Peter, would you agree? Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And so it, let's, let's just take that scenario that someone gets a positive PCR test. They ought to be getting a call from a contact tracer literally within 24 hours. 
that contact tracer needs to spend an hour or two or three with that individual, finding out everybody they've been in contact with, because all of those people need to be notified and tested. That, that's how truly effective contact tracing works. And it's not been done in this country. And that's why we are in so much more trouble here in the United States than in countries that have been doing that systematically. And I'd like to add something that last week when Arlene was talking about our testimonial, one of the things that really came through was our community um, feel like it can't happen to them. But I received a phone call from my daughter yesterday. She drove to Arizona with, in an RV with the family, her husband and her two children, and attended a wedding. There were 55 guests at the wedding, and this was in May in Arizona. And it was in a um, country club ballroom setting. The brother of the bride developed COVID symptoms within five days of the wedding and died in the hospital within two weeks of the ceremony. So the family is now devastated. And for those of us who feel it can't happen to me, it can happen to you. There is no treatment for this. We don't have a vaccine for this. So we can't emphasize enough that when you are taking these risks, sometimes those consequences that come with that risk we can't, we can't cure. A number of questions that come in uh, specific to starting up meetings again, and I, I want to spend a few minutes talking about those because that's one of the things we promised to do for this, this whole webinar. Um, a question from Kathy Berry, who's the incoming president uh, in a couple of weeks for my club, Los Altos, is saying that some clubs are declining to go ahead with live meetings, not only because of the health risk, but because it splits the club. Those in the high risk categories are faced with making a choice between risking their health or showing up for Rotary. Any comments about that in terms of a solution other than having the uh, hybrid model we've talked about of having live meetings of people who are young and healthy and can practice appropriate physical distancing and then running a live broadcast of that to the people that have to stay at home. I know that uh, the district governor and I have had many conversations. Uh, we fielded many calls um, asking for permission to meet when the county order clearly is shelter in place and meetings are only the household members. Even at Dryco, we've, uh, we've noted Alameda County will only allow meetings of actual employees of Dryco, so we're not eligible as a district to meet there at this time. So I think I would like to say to the clubs members on this call and the club presidents that are coming in that District Governor Ramesh has done a great service to our district by putting together this task force and we are a resource to you. So if your club and your board is dealing with how to do that, we invite you to reach out to us to help you navigate through this um, course of reopening and meeting in person. One of the key factors is gonna be your venue. And as Sergeant at Arms, I'm looking at venues where we can be outdoors, where we can host social activities for areas, for clubs and for the district. So I think continue to ask questions, go on to the county uh, website at uh, covid19.ca.gov and reach out to us as resources for you. We'll help guide you through this. Uh, let me, uh, thank you very much, Aggie. Um, you're an unusual Sergeant at Arms. It's not just a red jacketed one who just stands there and guides people and then go here, go there kind of a thing, but you're also a medical <laughs> expert, keeping us on the straight path and straight and narrow sometimes. So again, thanks so much, Aggie. But you know, I would point out to the, the four-way test that we came up with, you know, is it essential for in-person meeting? Are you going to be safe? Totally safe, not to just to yourself, but to your friends, your family that you're going back to, and who are you going to infect if you are an asymptomatic carrier? Safe to all concerned, just be fair to all concerned. Will it be legal? You know, what kind of liability are you taking on? As I believe that some people are taking uh, Things like uh, the disclaimers and so forth, the, the, the waivers, your sign off and so forth. What kind of liability are you going to put yourself into legally? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Just think about this. One stream of thinking is that if we all come out together live, we are all champions after this pandemic is over, just by that self. But that, just that statement that we're going to be live, alive, 
And here we are, this medical panel is helping you to stay alive, to stay healthy, to stay safe, stay safe. So keep those things in mind. There are, there are guidelines to physically meet at in-person meetings with Rotary. There are some, some very exceptional conditions if you really need to meet. There are, I think Aggie has already specified certain conditions and so forth. Stay, stay legal, stay safe. That's all I think we can say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, so this is, this One of the calls I received, Peter, was from my own daughter who's in San Diego. My granddaughter <laughs> is from high school and I was grateful to all the Rotarians who were calling Ramesh and me asking, when can we meet in person? So when my daughter asked me to join 36 friends and family for the graduation ceremony, the first thing I did is look up San Diego County, which I believe is now number three, most new infections in the state of California. And I provided this reference to my daughter and my sons, along with the attestation that all hotels in San Diego County are asking people to sign when they check in that says they're negative or they're quarantining and they'll be there for two weeks or a whole bunch of other requirements. So I made a very difficult decision not to go because I'm in the high risk category. And I think that my daughter made a decision that was not consistent with the San Diego County Health Department, but she did mitigate some of the arrangements that she had made. So it's a real personal choice I think each Rotarian has to make, but we are community leaders and we are the examples in our community. So I think that staying legal is a great idea. Thanks, Ramesh. Uh, yeah, I'd like to say one other thing because obviously I'm, I'm just ending up my presidential year and how I would think about it. And, and the thing that keeps me opting for virtual meetings is the fact that our members are older. They are, at, half of our members are over the age of 61. And so you really have to protect those 60-year-olds, 72-year-olds like me, 80-year-olds. And so you're right. It's not, I hadn't thought about the fairness issue that maybe those 30-year-olds or 40-year-olds feel okay meeting, but it isn't fair to the uh, older members. So remember your risk. Remember the risk of those older members. It's way higher. And this is an aerosol virus, so air conditioning systems in buildings can swirl that virus all around. I think... I think we, I think we as a society have COVID fatigue, and I think culturally we're impatient, and there's a lot of uh, messaging from all sorts of places that you know it's time to get back to work, it's time to get back to normal, it's time to reopen. Um, but I think that's, I think that's short-sighted, and I think we need to stay the course here. And we as medical professionals today are are trying to, you know, to, uh, to communicate that message of, of the importance. And, you know, it is that some, most of us are on the older end of the spectrum here, but um, it's, it's more than that. And uh, because it's our whole society. So I, I, I worry about this push that we're pushing too fast. Um, and I worry about that slide, Peter, that you showed that I hadn't seen before with the gray, the gray, area uh, of the counties that weren't ready and they're all the Bay Area counties if I read that map correctly. Yep, that's, you read that correctly. And remember the virus isn't tired. It's not tired at all. <laughs> it's just out there waiting. Um, Dr. Uh, Ronald Geberling, Geberling from Saratoga Rotary had a couple questions, a couple comments, really more comments. But he, he's pointing out that uh, people are getting a false sense of security. They're wearing a mask and figuring they're okay. But if you're wearing a mask, then touch your mask. You're transferring germs between your mask and your hands, whether or not you're wearing gloves. If you're in a service industry and you're wearing gloves, we don't change gloves or sanitize your hands between customers. Now your hands with or without glove are carrying their vectors for carrying germs from one person to another. And that's a very good point. Uh, I went to a coffee shop, uh, I rarely leave the house, but I, I did on uh, Saturday, went to have a cup of coffee with a friend outside about t uh, eight feet apart. And uh, he was wearing a mask that was a homemade and it covered about from here to here. Uh, if it covered his mouth, it didn't cover his nose. If he put it over his nose, it didn't cover his mouth. So I finally went back to my car and got him a surgical mask that I had next a spare that was in my glove box um, to protect me, <laughs> but also for him to have better protection going forward. 
And it occurred to me that the woman who was making our coffee had probably had the same pair of gloves on for the past uh, you know, several hours. And so she, in fact, is passing stuff on from one person to another. Um, unless she was changing them more often than I think she was or washing her hands more often. So there is a false sense of security from gloves and masks and people maybe need to have more information, more public service announcements about how to properly deal with a mask, uh, what masks are adequate, um, uh, how to use gloves to protect everybody and not just yourself. So all good points. Thank you, Dr. Gerberling. Um, a couple of people asked about contact tracing, volunteering that is. Uh, Glenn Kubiak is saying that several members of his club have tried to volunteer to perform contact tracing through the county's public health program, uh, but haven't been able to make any contact that's helpful. Do you know how Rotarians can volunteer in this crucial effort? Yeah, I can, I can handle that. So I'm a retired public health doctor. Uh, I also have uh, sent multiple emails. I've actually talked to uh, one person and uh, received replies from one person, and they're not interested in me uh, as, a, as a contact tracer. And I think the reason is, is because the governments all have lots of uh, union employees like librarians who don't have anything to do. There's, everything's closed. And so the contact people that they are training are those individuals who will not then have something important to do. The other thing is it's just volume. As I showed you, we've got a state of 40 million people. We're looking for 20,000 tracers. They've only trained 2,500 as of today. So there just aren't, there are lots of people available within government and there aren't very many training slots. And so I think it's very unlikely that a Rotarian uh, is going to end up uh, being utilized. Uh, Frank Furlot, past president in my club and assistant governor for, uh, for Region 9, uh, says he's reading that retail businesses are opening up and a number of restaurants are starting to allow outside alfresco dining. For somebody who wants to get out of self-sheltering, patronize the restaurants, especially ones that are owned by fellow Rotarians, have been really hit by all this. What could you do to make things safe going to an outdoor dining room at this point? Well, I'll take that one and then I'll invite our panelists to add on. If you're in a high risk group and you're out at a restaurant, you're at high risk to become infected. So if you're outdoors, it's lower risk than indoors because of the ventilation, the circulation going around. Um, you can't wear a mask and eat and drink at the same time. So you've got to focus in on social distancing and keeping six feet apart and being sure you're in a very well ventilated area. But in looking at the statistics this week in preparation for this town hall, personally, uh, I would not do it. Um, I, I would go briefly into an outdoor area for a few moments in time and then leave, but to sit outdoor long enough to have a dinner, which is usually 90 minutes being in a high risk category while we're in stage two statewide, I just don't feel like that's one of the safest um, ways I could be spending my time. Anyone else have a comment? So I'll make a small comment. Actually, it's more of a question to Arlene because in talking about sheltering fatigue, I think uh, many of us are looking for ways to get outside the house. And so my question, um, Arlene, you know, I, like a, I talk a lot about vitamin E, which I'm referring to exercise. So if you're outdoors, it's been said that if you're wearing a mask, if you're keeping some distancing, it's probably a good thing for you to get exercise, to go for walks outdoors, particularly in some of our parks. Um, yeah. what, what are your thoughts and, and what kind of mask would you wear? Because I was anticipating a question about exercise. It was more about exercise in general. Outdoors is obviously far better, taking walks, jogging. I think if you're if you're truly alone, then I think it's okay to not wear a mask. The problem is, you know, you you usually aren't. But but exercise I think people need to remember that exercise is medicine. I mean, food is medicine, exercise is medicine. And, um, you know, we know that in, in times of health, that exercise is a major benefit to, to immune system functioning. And it also improves the immune response to inflammation. And then, though, with illness, you know, if people have symptoms, of, this is just in general, uh, not specific to COVID, but if people have symptoms above the neck, in other words, uh, a cold, 
uh, you know, where the nasal passages are involved, exercise is okay, but people would probably want to reduce the intensity and length. But if you have symptoms below the neck, respiratory symptoms, um, coughing, fever, body aches, you know, stomach ache and cough, it's best to postpone exercise until those symptoms subside. Um, but I would highly recommend, recommend getting out there, um, doing walks, and you know, if you're, if you're in health to, to jog, it's good for your immune system. And wearing, you know, wearing masks, it's a question of if, sort of common sense. If you're in, a, in an area where there's, you're really not, you know, the idea is, well, if you pass someone, if you pass someone and you're, and you're, not, and you're not coughing, is it okay to, to um, not wear a mask? And I guess my feeling would be it, it, it probably is. Um, but I think the, the issue I have is, is really a closed system, like obviously a gym is, is a terrible place to be, in my opinion. Uh, but outside exercising, particularly solitary exercising, is, is very good. And, and so it's okay, you can be out walking your dog. In fact, I understand in Paris they even uh, rent out their dogs so people can take their dogs for a walk. Yeah. <laughs> I want you all to know that you're welcome to take my dog anytime as long as it's all done on COVID uh, restrictions. Okay, uh, Anonymous is asking, at the present rate of infection, what's your estimate of the soonest date that international travel will be safe? Well, I'm pretty uh, good at guessing, very intuitive. The president stopped international travel and on the state website, it's gonna take a, a decision by the president to reopen non-essential travel. I'm presuming they're talking about non-essential travel uh, as well as domestic travel. So there are uh, resources on the state government website. And as the other countries open up, this will be a decision that will be made at the, at the federal level. I wanted to add to that answer about travel, international travel. The answer I give people, and I'm a travel health specialist, is I will go overseas when I have effective vaccine inside me. Period. A Amen. Amen. Okay. Probably good advice. We have, we have made a, our best effort to spread awareness. We have made our best effort to spread wisdom and uh, safety knowledge. If we do this, if we spread this awareness at a rate which is higher than COVID, it'll be Rotary one, coronavirus zero. With that, thank you so very much. <laughs>